Thanks for tuning in. I'm Scott Walter. And I'm Michael Watson. In this episode, we examine the players in the continuing debate over gun control after another spree killing. This is the Influence Watch podcast. Last month, a deranged gunman killed 17 people at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida. Since the attack, activists have rekindled efforts to enact strict gun control with media and Democratic politicians seeking to go as far as banning all firearms that use semi-automatic operating mechanisms. By some estimates, that would be more than half the weapons in private hands. Left-wingers have rallied behind a number of Stoneman Douglas students who have become the faces of the gun control movement and the so-called March for Our Lives gun control rally that's scheduled for March 24. Behind the students are reportedly a number of large gun control single-issue groups, as well as broader multi-issue liberal interest groups, including the American Federation of Teachers, Government Worker Union, left-wing pressure group Move On, and former New York City Mayor Mike Bloomberg's Everytown. The rally has also received support from health insurer Aetna, which used $200,000 in rents it claims from monopolist healthcare provision to bus in marchers. Lined up against the institutional left is its perennial boogeyman, the National Rifle Association, and its roughly 5 million dues-paying members. Alongside and in competition with the NRA are a number of smaller, more purist gun rights organizations, the Second Amendment Foundation, Gun Owners of America, and the National Association for Gun Rights, among others, who are resisting concessions to the gun control forces. Public opinion is divided on the issue with passionate intensity and big money on both sides. With the press perhaps more aligned in favor of the left on this issue than any other, with the possible exception of abortion, can supporters of the Second Amendment continue their improbable holdout? Well, Mike, let's start with a bit of the history of gun control in America in the last century. So going back to your, you know, going back to your question, can the, the Second Amendment supporters continue their, their holdout? Uh, I think that's a, that, that's a, good, a good framing device. Because if I went back to 1988, if I went back 30, you know, 30 years, and I said that not only would handguns not be banned, they would be constitutionally protected by a Supreme Court decision in every jurisdiction of the United States where the Constitution applies, that it would be legal to carry concealed handguns without a permit in as many states as permits can be denied on discretionary grounds, and that what are often called, we'll get into terminology a little bit later, quote-unquote assault weapons, modern sporting rifles, would have been made illegal and then made legal again, and that while all that was going on, the violent crime rate would have... One half cut. One, yes. a, a cut in half. You would look at me like I, like I had two heads. All of that happened. Uh, in, in the 1980s, an outright ban on handguns was a very live political position. It was openly debated. Gallup polled it, found 40 to mid-40s support uh, all the way up until the, late, uh, the, the early 1990s. Uh, 1987, this kind, Florida kind of breaks the dam on what's known as shall-issue concealed carry laws, which is that as long as you pass a background check, as long as you meet whatever standards the government sets for proficiency with a weapon— that you can carry concealed in public within certain restrictions. Again, the gun control people predicted, literally predicted blood in the streets. Uh, now 41 of the 50 states have a shell issue law, and again, the violent crime rate is halved. Uh, in 1994, the Democrats pass a law banning semi-automatic rifles with certain cosmetic features, which they call assault weapons, in 2000, with a 10-year sunset. In 2004, again, they're thinking that this is going to be, we'll, you know, right into the election, you know, 1994, they're thinking, well, right into the 2004 election, that's an election year, there's no way it'll let it expire in an election year. It expires. And now the m most commonly privately owned, uh, long, uh, the most commonly sold privately owned long arm by most estimates, is a modern sporting rifle that would have been banned, the AR-15. So tr tremendous progress against gun control, 
uh, in recent decades uh, is, is a useful context to put the current fight uh, into. Well, and I'm sure, uh, I forget what the precise number of people with concealed carry per permits in those shall issue states is, but it's in the millions. And it's pretty in the, safe. In the, sta in the states that report them, just on the states that report them, which is not all of them, uh, it, it, is, it, is in, it is in the millions. Uh, and then that comes with an asterisk because 13 states don't require a permit for their citizens to carry concealed firearms. Yeah. So uh, one of the, uh, one of the uh, most powerful rules in politics and influence is precisely that uh, the larger the constituency affected, the harder it is to change existing policy. And this is the one area where there may have been some advancement by the gun control forces. Uh, the number of the percentage of households who own a firearm has dropped slightly. It's still over forty percent, uh, but it used to be closer to an outright majority. Now, more of those who own a firearm now own a concealable semi-automatic handgun or a modern sporting rifle, making it more relevant to them than somebody who owned, you know, dad's rifle that he brought back from World War I. Yeah. Now, as, as we've already mentioned, the, um, during the time in which there was this uh, considerable liberalization of restrictions on guns, uh, the overall crime rate and the violent crime rate uh, did not go in the direction that the gun control folks predicted. But on the other hand, in, in more recent years, there has been uh, an issue of spree killings. Since 1998, when uh, there was a, a, a spree shooting, a spree, a spree killing at Columbine High School in Colorado, there has been, and there's some question as to whether they're increasing or whether they're staying the same. Uh, a, a study came out uh, or was publicized, you know, was picked up last week in the, in the sort of conservative media, National Review and, uh, and other places, that found that there was no, no trend. But certainly with the, with the press coverage, the 24-hour news cycle, Every time one of these happens, one of these spree uh, spree killings happens, um, you know, it becomes it is a ma it is a major news event, uh, and this has brought to the fore again calls for some very extreme gun control and some less extreme. There was a, a, a spree killing in uh, Nevada in, last year where the the shooter used an accessory known as a bump fire stock, uh, which is a, a device that, for lack of a better term, allows a normal rifle, a normal semi-automatic rifle, to function like a machine gun. Uh, and President Trump, his Justice Department, uh, and even the National Rifle Association have said. Okay, maybe these need to be either regulate either the NRA wants them regulated as machine guns. The uh, you know the Trump administration has said we're studying to ban them, but again the laws are are technical in this area. Yes, plus just as a practical matter, uh, I suspect any rem half competent teenager can create something that functions like a bump stock. It's not an easily it, it's not so easily regulatable, uh, perhaps. Uh, possibly. Um, but, uh, well, this is definitely an area where the terminology uh, is important, and yet I know that uh, the Washington Post uh, criticized as gunsplaining, which is presumably is in the same evil box yeah, as mansplaining. Yeah, after, after, after mansplaining, the supposed, you know, practice of men who don't know anything going after ex women with expert knowledge just because they're men. Uh, no, in... Firearms regulation, very what seem like very fine technical distinctions, legally make enormous difference. Uh, the two that are that stick out and that are uh, intimately related to each other are the question of, you know, semi-automatic and assault weapon versus automatic and assault rifle. Uh, I'll start with automatic and assault rifle. Uh, Definitionally, an assault rifle is a long gun, a rifle, 
firing what's called an intermediate cartridge, a uh, in between a pistol round, which doesn't have particularly high velocity, and a very high velocity traditional rifle round, the one that comes out of your dad's hunting rifle that all the gun control people insist that they're not going to take away. Um, and capable of what is either called select or automatic fire, which means that if you pull the trigger and hold it, more bullets than one comes out. For automatic fire. For, for automatic fire. Mm-hmm. Under current law, the uh, all assault rifles that meet that definition, that, three, that threefold definition, specifically the third part, the automatic fire, are considered machine guns and are regulated very stringently. You can't, reg- you know, there's a registry of machine guns that private citizens can own. You can add no more guns to that. Uh, if in order to get one off the registry, you have to pass not only a background check, you not only have to pass, uh, not not only the, not even the normal background check, it's an in-depth, deeper background check uh, under what's called the National Firearms Act. Uh, you have to pay a National Firearms Act tax, and because you can't register any new ones, they range in price from several thousand dollars up to the tens and twenties of thousands, because many of them are collectible in their own right. They're old, you know, old German guns that were brought back from World War II or, you know, uh, guns that have historical import. Uh, But then we get into the question of semi-automatic and assault weapon. Uh, A semi-automatic fire means that when I pull the trigger, one bullet comes out, and then the operation of the gun, springs and the gases that are emitted in the discharging of a, of a round, seat the next round so that I can just take my finger off, pull the trigger again, another bang. Uh, the, they are regulated. Semi-automatic operation is regulated just as a normal fire. You go to the gun store. If you, if you are in a state that has relatively liberal gun laws like Virginia— uh, you go to the gun store, you say, I want that semi-automatic rifle, you fill out a form, the, a federal ATF form, the guy takes it to the back, puts you into the system, runs it, runs a instant criminal background check through what's called Nix. Nix comes back, thumbs up, you, you, can, you give him money and walk out the store with your gun. Assault weapon... Is, "Quote unquote." Yeah, I, I'm doing I'm doing air quotes for our, our audio listeners. Uh, is a essentially made up term for a semi-automatic rifle that has any of a number of cosmetic, ultimately cosmetic features, things like a pistol grip, a, f, uh, a st- an adjustable stock, uh, a a flash suppressor. Things that actually add nothing to the things that add nothing to the, the ul- add nothing to the ultimate lethality of the weapon. Uh, that uh, basically the politicians think are scary and that you should not have. Uh, the where there's some confusion is because a lot of gun, a lot of semi-automatic civilian guns that are considered assault weapons. I put in air quotes are either civilianized versions or modeled on those fully automatic assault rifles that I mentioned earlier. The most notable being, of course, the AR-15 and the AK series of the, the Kalashnikov series of rifles. Yeah. Well, the to get to the uh, groups that are important influencers in the gun control debates... Uh, and as always, we want to remind <laughs> listeners that they can go to influencewatch.org and get even more information. But um, uh, the gun control side of the equation, uh, the groups have been growing uh, in recent years. Is, is that correct? Yeah. So it used to be that there was no particular like NRA of gun control, one entity that was the, you know, anti-NRA. <clears throat> yeah, anti an anti-NRA um, on the gun on the gun control side. Uh, you know, the Brady campaign existed, uh, but all the groups together uh, in 2013, some research the Capital Research Center did uh, back then said that together they were all about $20 million, uh, in, in budget. Uh, shortly thereafter, former mayor of New York City, Michael Bloomberg, a adamant advocate for gun control, 
And uh, billionaire. And billionaire businessman. Uh, said he would write a check for $50 million, $50, million of his own money to, uh, to support gun control. And that is from where we get every town for gun safety. Gun safety being the new uh, poll-tested term for gun control. Because, as I mentioned earlier, over the last 30 years, gun control has not been advancing with a few limited, very limited exceptions. So changing the label is a, is a, is a smart thing to do. Um, but uh, there were some predecessor groups that led into uh, right. Every Town, right. which, is now, which now is the main Yeah, which now is the main, anti, uh, the main gun control group. Uh, so when Bloomberg was mayor, he convened this Mayors Against Illegal Guns with Tom Menino, who was, the, was then the mayor of Boston. He is now deceased. Uh, and they got a bunch of mayors to sign a statement saying that there should be more gun control. Um, now, they probably should have been policing their own ranks better because yes. Qu- they, quite a number of, uh, they were, of they, embarrassing stories. As, as the Second Amendment Foundation, one of the uh, pro gun rights or, uh, organizations, will have, was happy to point out, um, uh, a number of the of the mayors against illegal guns were not mayors against illegal activity in their personal lives. <laughs> um, among the among the uh, among the rogues gallery, uh, Frank Melton, the former mayor of Jackson, Mississippi, was charged with firearms offenses. Uh, Gary Becker of Racine, Wisconsin, was charged with sexual misconduct with a child, and Kwame Kilpatrick, the former mayor of Detroit, was charged with assault on a cop. <laughs> so yes, as you say, not mayors against illegal activities. <laughs> Um, now, there also was uh, the group Moms, uh, Moms Demand Action, uh, and one of its uh, officials is still active with every town, but has a somewhat checkered past. Yeah. Uh, so Shannon Watts was tapped to be the leader of Moms Demand Action. She is still a one of the lead spokespersons for every town. Um, and she actually quite recently got into it uh, in a in a Twitter spat with a center right journalist uh, who had written an op ed for the New York Times, yes, this is this is a shock, an op ed for the New York Times saying this is why I own guns, uh, and she went into her history about uh, when she was a child, her mother her mother had used a, a firearm to defend against a break in, uh, then later in life she had been threatened by neo Nazis, uh, and so. For those reasons, she went through all the paperwork in New Jersey, which has extremely strict gun control laws, to uh, to procure a firearm. And uh, uh, Ms. Watts's approach to this this Jewish woman uh, buying a firearm to protect herself against neo Nazis, and then uh, and then writing about it in the New York Times and saying that this is why I did that. Uh, that she, Shannon Watts chided her for, quote, her privilege in feeling that a gun will make you safer, in part because you are white, close quote. Um, you know, the, the, the woman who wrote the, wrote the article, uh, a woman by the name of Bethany Mandel, had been identified by the Anti-Defamation League as one of the top 10 most threatened Jewish journalists of 2016. <laughs> she had, if anyone had very good cause to defend oneself, you would think she would have. <laughs> And uh, I think I would add that uh, it isn't clear that she was highly privileged, given that fact. Given given that fact, certainly. Yeah. The um, and w- I think an important data point just to to mention is uh, that the people who defend gun rights uh, are not urging for lots of bullets for bullets constantly to be fired against bad guys. It's a very important point that the mere possession of a gun can uh, be a powerful deterrent. The hope, the hope is that the p- possession or an extremist, the display of a weapon, uh, will end the threat before a shot needs to be fired, obviously. Yes, and there, there are debates over the precise number of times, because obviously it's not easy to count the time it, somebody simply pulled out a gun, never shot it, but got pulled out, guy Pulled out, away. displayed, or otherwise, or, you know, like loaded a shot, you know, racked a shotgun, makes that ka noise, you know, and then the guy runs away. Uh, the estimates are that the number of "quote unquote" defensive gun uses uh, annually—it's usually low six figures to low seven figures. Yes, it's a very large number, and uh, and I would say uh, anecdotally, 
uh, a good friend of mine years ago had a girlfriend who was very worried because uh, she lived in an apartment complex in the greater DC area, and it was right by uh, an on-ramp and off-ramp to the Beltway. So cars were stolen at a considerable clip there because it was you grab the car, you hop on the Beltway, you're gone. Uh, and she was terrified that there uh, were going to be burglaries as well. So my friend, he never gave her any ammunition. He simply gave her an old goose gun, which was precisely a pump-action shotgun. And sure enough, it wasn't that long later that she woke up in the middle of the night. She heard an intruder downstairs uh, and trembling. Uh, she got the, uh, the goose gun, opened her bedroom door on the second floor, and simply did the famous ka-chunk. Mm. Uh, and there was silence for a second, and then there was the sound of a, a man uh, rapidly departing her apartment. So, yes, this is not a trifling thing. Similarly, my own wife, uh, we didn't have a gun in our home until we had children in our home. But when she was going to have children uh, of her own to be worried about, and I would be traveling out of town from time to time, uh, she very much wanted to have something to protect herself with. Well, uh, let's move on to some of the other significant gun organizations uh, there's another one, for instance, uh, connected to uh, Representative uh, Gabby Giffords. So former Representative Gabrielle Giffords was shot by a, like, diagnosed deranged lunatic uh, in 2011. And subsequent to that, she and her husband formed this, uh, this group called Americans for Responsible Solutions, which is also one of the gun control organizations that is backing these, uh, these students um, in their in their quote-unquote march for our lives. Uh, kind of, if I, if I may do a brief aside on, 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 the, uh, on, on the students, you know, obviously you see this, this, organi you know, this organizing behavior from the liberal interest groups, but that one thing I, I want to be very clear about is that doesn't mean that the kids were put up to, were necessarily put up to it. Obviously, you go through this traumatic experience, and if you are from a liberal town, a liberal area, Broward County, Florida, which is where Parkland is located, voted 66 to 30, plus or minus two on either side for Hillary Clinton, uh, and you're from a liberal milieu, and you have probably proto-liberal beliefs, and then this thing happens to you, and then you're looking for a way, you know, I need to do liberal stuff now. You know, I need to, I need to, you know, bring liberalism that I believe in and I, I have been reinforced in my belief by this act uh, to the masses, you know. And then comes in the organizing people. They see, ah, you are interested. You care. I can rally you. I can rally behind you. I can use you as the face of my, uh, I can, you know, Im you are willing to be employed as the face of my, of my movement. Uh, you know, it's a very effective strategy. It is a very good strategy, but it doesn't involve, you know, I mean, there have been conspiracy theories that the kids are quote-unquote crisis actors, you know, somehow just, you know, either you know, they weren't even there, that they were just, you know, that they're just actors who were brought into this. That is absolute nonsense. They are being supported by these institutions because these institutions know that people who sincere, who you know, or genuinely believe in a cause and are extraordinarily motivated. And it's always awkward when you're arguing against someone who's underage that they see them as effective messengers, but they, they are spousing a message that they genuinely believe in. Well, the, uh, in the Gabby Giffords case, as you say, it was a, a person diagnosed with serious mental problems. And I want to take a brief aside on that because I was uh, on the White House Domestic Policy Council uh, back in the 2000s when you had the horrific shooting at Virginia Tech, uh, also done by an absolutely mentally disturbed uh, kid. He, well, young man. Um, he killed over two dozen uh, of his fellow students before killing himself. And um, uh, we held a conference. There was a White House conference on school shootings. It's the same week there had also been a shooting uh, at an Amish elementary school. Um, so it was a tr truly horrible week for America, and uh, we dug in in the White House as a, as a policy advisor. We dug deep into um, all of the various government policies that affect this kind of thing. And one thing that's 
uh, that's a serious problem. The Virginia Tech school officials never notified the man's parents that they were deeply disturbed by him, including having both teachers and students say, gee, this guy seems like he's somebody who would go nuts and kill people. And similar similar issues were brought up with the with the uh, the deranged man who shot the kids in, in Florida. It, that yes. um, you know, in there was a spree shooting at a church in Texas last year where actually the shooter should have been prohibited from buying a firearm under the background check laws. Uh, because he, I believe, had a domestic violence conviction in the military justice system, but the military justice system had never bothered to report it. Yes, so there's there are lots of government problems in this, plus the FBI has not covered itself in glory in a number of these, including the most recent Parkland one. But what I was going to say about the, the young man is, uh, in Virginia Tech, uh, everyone has heard of HIPAA regulations, H-I-P-A-A, which uh, govern the confidentiality of medical records, but there is another law called FERPA, F-E-R-P-A, that governs educational uh, privacy concerns, and these two horribly complicated, uh, messy laws uh, even interact, making, you know, they actually make each other worse, crudely put, Um, and they are the reason that Virginia Tech was terrified of going to the man who did indeed kill dozens of people. and telling his parents, you know, we're really dis- we're really concerned about your highly disturbed young man who seems to be getting worse and worse. So um, the uh, the idea that uh, government regulation is always going to work wonderfully and achieve all of its fine and noble aims, as spelled out by congressmen in front of a camera, uh, is not true. But um, well, we've been talking about some of the the single issue left wing gun control organizations. Uh, Let's also mention the fact that um, gun control, uh, like abortion, is something that is pretty sacrosanct across the entire spectrum of left-wing groups of, of yeah, all I'm, issues. I'm unaware, I am rest. unaware of any liberal organization that does not support a, an assault weapons ban uh, and does not support broader, broader gun control. Yeah, and be a, it would be a rare one. Well, now, let's flip to the other side of things. Uh, the folks uh, who view themselves as uh, staunch defenders of our Second Amendment liberties. Uh, the most obvious, of course, is the National Rifle yeah, the, Association. Yeah, the, the elephant in the room is the NRA. Uh, the National Rifle Association of America uh, has been around since the 1870s. Uh, the, its original purpose uh, was a bunch of Union officers who had been horrified by the poor performance of Union troops during the Civil War, especially against Southern, Southern troops who were from uh, farming backgrounds and had more experience handling weapons before they, uh, before they got into the army, uh, decided that there needed to be an, an organization, an institution to promote effectively military training uh, in case the Union needed to call, the, the United States needed to call up soldiers again like it did for the Civil War. Uh, and in a, in a large part, the NRA continues this mission. It continues to provide uh, one of its major missions is to provide uh, firearm safety education, firearms use instruction, uh, to promote uh, marksmanship com- competitions. Uh, that is a lar- that is a large part of it, of its work. Uh, the organization itself is is pretty big. Uh, its its member dues alone uh, are roughly a hun- in twenty sixteen were one hundred and sixty three million dollars. Um, and they've been over 100 million for, for several years. Uh, and that gets into something, one of the common misconceptions about the NRA. The, the NRA, is, especially its political opponents, generally say, well, you know, you're the NRA, you're the gun industry. It's actually not precise. The Trade Association for Civilian Firearms Manufacturers is a different group called the National Shooting Sports Foundation. Uh, what the NRA is, is a membership organization of mostly gun owners. I do not own a firearm, but I used to be a member of the NRA before I quit it over various political differences. Um, the And it is the vehicle for those members. And according to its own estimation, and if you you know, just do a simple division of its dues by the dues rate, you get a number somewhere in the order of $5 million. Uh, Which, uh, to, to, to use the 
nice uh, politically effective slogan, uh, the largest civil rights organization in America, which that, is an that, interesting that, thing to consider. That, that, has, that has been their tagline. Uh, and that's where you get the question of why would a congressman, and I choose a retired, I choose a retired member for tax reasons, uh, and I choose one, I, I assure you, purely at random, former Representative Joe Scarborough of Florida, uh, who as a commentator on MS, MSNBC has come out staunchly in favor of a ban on, on, assault, on assault weapons, uh, if not all semi-automatic weapons. I don't know where he stands on that, on that divide. Um, but uh, as Jay Cost of the Weekly Standard, National Review, and other places found out by going to his archives of friend of Capital Research Center Michael Barone's Almanac of American Politics, gee, when Joe Scarborough was a congressman, he voted the NRA line. <laughs> So why oddly would you, enough. Oddly enough. So why would you do that if you're, why would you vote against your, I mean, I assume he's being sincere now. I would not assume otherwise. Uh, would con then Congressman Scarborough have voted the NRA line? And that's because the NRA has the ability to rally that membership to either in a primary election or in a general election. Uh, part of the reason that Bernie Sanders got his start uh, one of the weird things about gun politics is that Vermont is one of the most pro-gun states in the nation, even though it's strongly democratic and strongly left and just about everything else. Uh, the then con one of the, the Republican congressmen, or, jeez, oh, I don't remember if he was sitting congressman or if he was candidate, uh, you know, had come out for some gun control. Sanders was, at the time because he was only representing Vermont. He wasn't trying to create a national left-wing movement, even though he had been, you know, even though he was a socialist and had left-wing beliefs on basically everything, uh, you know, was not going to be a hostile vote to the NRA. To the NRA, the NRA endorsed him and supported his, and supported his campaign. <laughs> yes. Uh, the, well, one of the things we should, uh, we should point out, of course, is that when you're talking about influence in politics, uh, intensity matters, and uh, Intens intensity absolutely matters. You know the the great complaint of the media is, well, geez, sick, you know, in the latest Quinnipiac poll taken a day after the after the spree shooting, you know, ninety percent of people want gun control or whatever. You know, how can they how can they not do gun control? And the answer is that that ninety percent, first of all, you know, as weeks go by, starts tracking back down towards fifty. And the side, then that ten, in addition to increasing its numbers as the sh as the shock recedes, really cares and will hold it against you with the fire of a thousand suns if you go against them. Yeah. Well, that's uh, that's the NRA side of things, but of course uh, the NRA is by no means the only or organization uh, dedicated to fighting uh, gun control. Who are some of the others? So. In something that must cause people like former Congressman Scarborough just endless confusion, uh, one of the main complaints by gun rights supporters of the NRA is that they compromise too much. Uh, so they have formed the you know the uh, sort of no compromise wing of of the gun of the gun rights movement, and you have uh, the National Association of Gun Rights, which is uh, aligned with. Uh, some of the libertarian political figures, they are aligned with Rand Paul, uh, senator from Kentucky, and Thomas Massey, congressman from uh, also Kentucky, um, budget of roughly $10 million a year. And then you have uh, perhaps a little bit better known, even though they're smaller, uh, the Gun Owners of America, which styles itself as the no compromise wing of the gun, of the gun rights movement, uh, estimated to have about 300,000 members uh, and a budget of roughly $2.5 million. Uh, there's also a, a principally a legal group, the, the Second Amendment Foundation, which <clears throat> kind of their biggest feather in their cap is they launched the, the McDonald v. Chicago case. So there was a Supreme Court case called Heller that held that under federal jurisdiction, because D.C. is officially controlled by Congress and Congress alone, that under federal jurisdiction you had an individual right to keep and bear arms, and among the things that you were, among the arms you were individually allowed to keep and bear were pistols. Um, and so Chicago had previously effectively banned pistols. Uh, the Second Amendment Foundation launches its case to get that holding against D.C. 
expanded to the states under what's called the incorporation doctrine. Uh, and in 2010, they got to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said, yes, this individual right is incorporated against the states. Yeah. Uh, I, I insist on a quick sidebar, which is the, because um, you mentioned Chicago in that. Uh, Chicago, of course, has long been one of the bastions of gun control and the left, uh, some of the most stringent gun control in America. And uh, the data do not back up the idea that that is a way to uh, less bloodshed. Uh, in fact, here's a simple the, the, question. And, and, and the complaint is always, oh, but they can just drive across the border to Indiana. But, of course, you don't hear about Indianapolis having similar homicide problems that Chicago has. <laughs> no. So, in fact, that would be my, that would be my question, would be the, uh, a, a non-existent data point, which is name me the city that has strict gun control that has a very low violent crime rate. About the only one, and there, there is one, is New York City. Uh, New York City, however, New York City is perhaps the weirdest part of America. Uh, mm -hmm. It is, you know, it, it is the only place where we approach European population density. It is the only place where, uh, you know, where, where half the population commutes not using an automobile. Uh, and also New York got to be, old New York got to be new New York because former mayors Giuliani and Bloomberg used the police force to crack down hard. What I find interesting is that the same people who express what I believe is an ultimately legitimate concern that the police can abuse their authority, that the police can abuse their, uh, their ability to use force, uh, then that the police that those abusive police should then not only be the only ones to bear arms, but should go around and kicking in people's doors and taking their guns away. <laughs> yes, well, and mm. and uh, conversely, on the other side, I would say that the uh, the effective policing that Giuliani and and uh, relatively speaking Bloomberg after, as opposed to the Bill De Blasio of currently in office, um, they did the kind of gun control that the NRA does not object to. Namely, there, you know, I don't know of any gun control group that says it's great for criminals to have weapons. And of course, what the NYPD was doing when it was driving down the murder rate at an enormous clip was precisely uh, keenly looking out for and, and stopping uh, gentlemen who looked as if they might possess illegal firearms. Yeah, the, sto the what was known as stop and frisk. People who in the NYPD's position were providing reasonable suspicion that they were carrying a concealed handgun, which for all of the Giuliani years and almost all of the Bloomberg years was categorically illegal uh, or effectively categorically. It, it remains effectively categorically illegal uh, in New York City. Uh, so obviously if you were carrying a concealed handgun, you weren't supposed to. Yes, and the, uh, this this is actually a neglected part, place where the uh, the Venn diagram of different groups does overlap. Uh, nobody left, right, or center has an issue with criminals not being able to carry concealed weapons walk, walking around uh, the streets, and uh, also on the the mental illness side. Now that becomes more complicated about how you're exactly going to define that legislation. But generally speaking, if you are talking about uh, uh, deeply troubled people like the Virginia Tech shooter or the Parkland Florida shooter or the rest, there isn't anybody saying those folks should have guns, uh, should be allowed to, to, right. to carry guns. Around. And, 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 and I'll, I'll throw in one other thing. So we, you know, earlier when we were discussing terminology, we mentioned the background check system. Uh, crooks obviously know that the background check system exists, and if they've got priors, they know that the background check would flag them. So what crooks do to get guns is they go to their friend, who doesn't have any priors, uh, give him some money, say, go to the gun store, buy, a gun, buy me a gun. And that person goes and does that and comes back with a gun and gets a cut. That is a federal felony. That is what's known as a straw buyer uh, because it is explicitly designed to cheat the background check system. Uh, and... What the federal prosecutor, the federal U.S. attorney in Chicago said at one point was, we will categorically not prosecute straw buyer cases. <laughs> um, 
which seems yet another which, which, odd thing for people in favor of gun control mm -hmm, to be doing. Right. Uh, because mm -hmm. if there ever were gun <laughs> legitimate gun control, that would be it. Uh, well, we've been talking about the groups here, Mike, but uh, uh, who are trying to influence policy. But let's let's touch for a second on uh, the in the news policies that are being fought over. Uh, what are a couple of the top uh, issues now at stake? So while the media is spending all its time talking about assault weapons bans and banning all semi-automatic firearms, uh, the current political situation makes both of those relatively unlikely, um, at least in the short term. Uh, we have what might actually pass are something called the Scop School Violence Act. The principal uh, plank of it would increase school security funding and the availability of school security technologies. And then another another bill called Fix Nix. Remember, Nix is the National Instant Criminal Background Check System, uh, which would uh, plug try to plug the holes that the Sutherland's the the Texas spree shooter had fallen through. Require more rigorous reporting. Also, uh, the uh, Charleston terrorist uh, had a drug conviction, had a drug charge that should have precluded him from buying a firearm. He bought. He was able. That wasn't reported. He was able to buy a firearm. He killed nine people, including a sitting state senator. The. Uh, so what Fix Nix is trying is is an attempt to do is an attempt to plug those reporting holes, that seem to be popping up. Okay. Well, those are some of the short term issues uh, in the uh, gun disputes. But if we pull back and take sort of a larger cultural frame, uh, it was suggested uh, in recent weeks that the NRA faces uh, a difficulty that's also faced by another powerful DC lobby, uh, the American Israeli Political Action Committee. Uh, Public APAC, Affairs Committee. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, sorry, uh, APAC, uh, that in both cases, because of polarized American politics, um, these groups, which traditionally have been very happy to be bi uh, bipartisan, um, are now running into polarized political problems, and they've t and what's interesting is they've taken exactly opposite approaches. Uh, APAC, we went into some detail about APAC and American-Israeli relations last week, uh, has tried to be scrupulously bipartisan. The National Rifle Association, I mentioned that I used to be a member and I quit over political differences. Here they are, uh, has become pretty adamantly a. Trump Defense League. Uh, they seem to be wandering outside, you know, if you go look at the promotions for NRA TV, which is their uh, uh, their media, their kind of in-house media arm, you know, there's a lot about, you know, the Women's March and Trump-style attacks on the press and one of their presenters wearing a T-shirt that says Socialist Tears. I mean... I mentioned how the NRA kicked off Bernie Sanders' political career. <laughs> um, while they may regret that because Bernie Sanders now supports gun control, uh, they, had a, they had a good reason for doing it, which is that when your cause becomes monopartisan, then it really does ride on every single election. If you have bipartisan consensus or bipartisan, uh, or bipartisan approach of a, sing of a single issue— Whoever, you know, who's the speaker, who's, to a lesser extent, who's the president, doesn't matter as much. The most successful issue advocacy organization in American history, of course, is the Anti-Saloon League, which won a constitutional amendment to ban an act engaged in by 60% of the public. And it did it by being ruthlessly nonpartisan. It didn't matter if you were a Republican who voted dry or a Democrat who voted dry. You had the entire support of the Anti-Saloon League. That's the NRA used to be a little bit like that. Uh, the NRA used, you know, even as recently as last as the 2016 elections, you know, endorsed a Democrat for governor of Missouri. Uh, you know, it had it had Democrats uh, uh, that it supported in other, you know, it had rural Democrats that it supported. I I don't think this is me playing. This is me engaging in a bit of rank punditry. I don't think that aligning yourself so closely with the Republicans and so closely, especially with the Trump administration, is how you advance a single issue. 
Though, of course, folks on the other side might say that as the left becomes ever more extreme uh, in, its, in its gun control uh, passion, that, uh, that you're going to have to pick sides. And, and, yeah, stuck. and the, the ultimate question is, are, is, is, that a cho- you know, is there a, a choice that you even have? Uh, and, okay, you know, we've seen in the past few weeks, we've seen the left go hard against, any, against businesses that have... Uh, that had corporate um, ties, corporate tie, corporate mm-hmm. corporate ties to the NRA, uh, most notably Delta Airlines, who then got retaliated against by the state of Georgia, who said, "Oh, that corporate welfare tax break that you were going to, to get, well, you don't get it anymore." Uh, you know, again, maybe maybe there's not a choice, but it would be, but that, but again, that to me is where you have a group like Gun Owners of America covering your right flank, you know. Uh, that there, that I think there is an opportunity. I mean, you see it in, in public opinion polling. Um, you know, Quinnipiac did some polling on on bans on semi-automatic weapons and bans on the AR-15. And take a guess, which age bracket was the least in favor of those bans? You tell me. The youngest, eighteen to thirty-four. Uh, which kind of goes against the the media narrative, which is that the children are going to march on Washington on March 24th and they're going to win gun control. Uh, you know, obviously, 18 to 34 is strongly Democratic. In a Pew poll on the midterms, they were, you know, 60-30 for the Democratic candidate. Uh, but they're not, but they are not necessarily favorable, at least at this point, to gun control. Well, and, that is a and and leaving point. and leaving by being the Trump Defense League, I feel like you're leaving potential supporters on the field because do you you know those people aren't ready to sign up for a wall. They aren't willing to sign up for tariffs that even a lot of Republicans think are a bad idea. But they might be able to sign up to oppose a ban on semi-automatic rifles, and if the NRA isn't to be opposing bans on semi-automatic rifles, what purpose does it serve? Well, uh, plenty to, plenty of things to argue about, but uh, that is our show for this week. And if you're listening to this on iTunes or Stitcher, you should know that we broadcast a live video version of the podcast at 10 a.m. every Thursday on Facebook Live and YouTube. Uh, and you can find our pages by searching Capital Research Center. Uh, if you're watching the video version, we encourage you to subscribe to the audio on your preferred podcast platform. We'll see you next week.